Hello all, and welcome back to Tangents on Cracked Spines. Today we continue with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with your host, Frankie. Um, before we get started, it does have some adult themes um, dealing with death and murder, uh, especially those of uh, young ones, and may not be appropriate for all audiences, so please be advised. Starting with a synopsis, Victor had been in a delirium and had finally awoken to find that his best friend Clerval had been nursing him for several months uh, through his mad ravings and fevers. And when he awoke, he got a letter from his uh, semi-sister cousin person who he is betrothed to because 1800s uh, named Elizabeth and she gave him all the small town gossip about his brothers his herself his dad a bunch of people around town and a lady named Justine who had been uh, taken in and raised by their family mostly as a housekeeper but with much better education had been sent back to her mother Mother went crazy, sent back to the town, uh, back to the Frankenstein residence. Um, and he's like, Victor is like, oh, I must go back and wanted to know when it would be available. But first he helped Clerval get settled in school in Ingolstadt and realized that scientific apparatus was, uh, triggering to him for the horrors that he had done through science. Again, folks, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so he settled in with Clerval with literature studies and uh, and language studies. Discovered that he actually really liked the way um, people in Asia wrote. Um, and then weather hit and he wasn't able to go back for any longer. And finally come spring, his father was like, yes, we need you back like now, but not under happy circumstances because his little brother had been murdered and not like the just younger brother, the like six year old one, William, and everybody is devastated and they find out that. They think it's Justine, the one that they've, the maid they've practically raised. And everybody is very sad about this. Victor immediately finds a horse, hops on it, and starts uh, rushing towards home. The closer he gets, though, the more he's like, crap, I haven't been home in six years. I'm a little worried about how much things have changed or not changed in my memory. Well, he got there late enough and during a rainstorm, thunderstorm, that the uh, gates to his town were closed anyways. So he kind of went camping on a lake nearby and saw his wretched creature in the lightning. And he's like, I know who killed my brother. And then resolved not to tell anybody because he would sound like a lunatic, especially considering... It was well known that he was sick with the delirium at the time he is referencing. And then he finds out that Justine is on trial and is like, no, I must tell. And his family thinks he's nuts. And now we begin. Chapter 7. We passed a few sad hours until 11 o'clock when the trial was to commence. My father and the rest of the family being obliged to attend as witnesses, I accompanied them to the court. During the whole of this wretched mockery of justice, I suffered living torture. It was to be decided whether the result of my curiosity and lawless devices would cause the death of two of my fellow beings. One, a smiling babe full of innocence and joy, 
the other far more dreadfully murdered with every aggravation of infamy that could make the murder memorable in horror. Justine was also a girl of merit and possessed qualities which promised to render her life happy. Now was all to be obliterated in ignom ignominious grave that and I the cause. A thousand times rather would I have confessed myself guilty of the crime ascribed to Justine, but I was absent when it was committed, and such a declaration would have been considered as the ravings of a madman, and would not have exculpated her uh, who suffered through me. Exculpated? I think I'm well read, and there are some words here that I'm like, huh? The appearance of Justine was calm. She was dressed in mourning, and her countenance, always engaging, was rendered by the solemnity of her feelings, exquisitely beautiful. Yet she appeared confident in innocence, and did not tremble, although gazed on and execrated by thousands. For all the kindness which her beauty might otherwise have excited was obliterated in the minds of the spectators by the imagination of the enormity she was supposed to have committed. She was tranquil. Yet her tranquility was evidently constrained, and as her confusion had been before abduced, adduced as a proof of her guilt, she worked up her mind to an appearance of courage. When she entered the court, she threw her eyes around it and quickly discovered where we were seated. A tear seemed to dim her eye when she saw us, but she quickly recovered herself, and a look of sorrowful affection seemed to attest her utter guiltlessness. The trial began, and after the advocate against her had stated the charge, several witnesses were called. Several strange facts combined against her, which might have staggered anyone who had not such proof of her innocence as I had. She had been out the whole of the night on which the murder had been committed, and towards morning had been perceived by a market woman not far from the spot where the body of the murdered child had been afterwards found. The woman asked her what she did there, but she looked very strangely and only returned a confused and unintelligible answer. She returned to the house about eight o'clock, and when one inquired where she had passed the night, she replied that she had been looking for the child and demanded earnestly if anything had been heard concerning him. When shown the body, she fell into violent hysterics and kept her bed for several days. The picture was then produced which the servant had found in her pocket, and when Elizabeth, in a faltering voice, proved that it was the same which, an hour before the child had been missed, she had placed round his neck. A murmur of horror and indignation filled the court. Justine was called on for her defense. As the trial had proceeded, her countenance had altered. Surprise, horror, and misery were strongly expressed. Sometimes she struggled with her tears, but when she was desired to plead, she collected her powers and spoke in an audible, although variable voice. God knows, she said, how entirely I am innocent, but I do not pretend that my protestations should acquit me. I rest my innocence on a plain and simple explanation of the facts which have been adduced against me. And I hope the character I have always borne will incline my judges to a favorable interpretation where any circumstance appears doubtful or suspicious. By then, she related that by permission of Elizabeth, she had passed the evening of the night on which the murder had been committed at the house of an aunt in Shen, a village situated about a league from Geneva. On her return at about nine o'clock, she met a man who asked her if she had seen anything of the child who was lost. She was alarmed by this account and passed several hours in looking for him. When the gates of Geneva were shut and she was forced to remain several hours of the night in a barn belonging to a cottage, being unwilling to call up the inhabitants to whom she was well known, unable to rest or sleep, she quitted her asylum early that she might again endeavor to find my brother. If she had gone near the spot where his body lay, it was without her knowledge. That she had been bewildered and questioned by the market woman, 
was not surprising since she had passed a sleepless night and the fate of poor William was yet uncertain. Concerning the picture, she could give no account. I know, continued the unhappy victim, how heavily and fatally this one circumstance weighs against me, but I have no power of explaining it. And when I have expressed my utter ignorance, I am only left to conjecture concerning the probabilities by which it might have been placed in my pocket. But here also I am checked. I believe that I have no enemy on earth, and none surely would have been so wicked as to destroy me wantonly. Wantonly, sorry. Did the murderer place it there? I know of no opportunity afforded him for so long. Or if I had, why should he have stolen the jewel to part with it again so soon? I commit my cause to the justice of my judges, yet I see no room for hope. I beg permission to have a few witnesses examined concerning my character, and if their testimony shall not overweigh my supposed guilt, I must be condemned, although I would pled, ple pledge my salvation on my innocence. Several witnesses were called, who had known her for many years, and they spoke well of her, but fear and hatred of the crime of which they supposed her guilty rendered them timorous and unwilling to come forward. Elizabeth saw even this last resource, her excellent dispositions and irreproachable conduct about to fail the accused when, although violently agitated, she desired permission to address the court. I am, said she, the cousin of the unhappy child who was murdered, or rather his sister, for I was educated by and have lived with his parents ever since and even long before his birth. It may therefore be judged indecent in me to come forward on this occasion. But when I see a fellow creature about to perish though the coward through the cowardice of her pretended friends, I wish to be allowed to speak, that I may say that I know of her character. I am well acquainted with the accused. I have lived in the same house with her, at one time for five and at another for nearly two years. During all that period, she appeared to me the most amiable and benevolent of human creatures. She nursed Madame Frankenstein, my aunt, in her last illness with the greatest affection and care, and afterwards attended her own mother during a tedious illness, in a manner that excited the admiration of all who knew her. After which she again lived in my uncle's house, where she was beloved by all the family, she was warmly att attached to the child whom is now dead, and acted towards him like the most affectionate mother. For my own part, I do not hesitate to say not that, notwithstanding all the evidence produced against her, I believe and rely on her perfect innocence. She had no temptation for such an action, as to the bauble on which the chief proof rests, if she had earnestly desired it, I should have willingly given it to her. So much do I esteem and value her. Excellent, Elizabeth. A murmur of approbation was heard, but it was excited by her generous interference, and not in favor of poor Justine, of whom the public indignation was turned with renewed violence, charging her with the blackest ingratitude. She herself wept as Elizabeth spoke, but she did not answer. My own agitation and anguish was extreme during the whole trial. I believed in her innocence. I knew it. Could the demon who had, I did not for a minute doubt, murdered my brother, also in his hellish sport, have betrayed the innocent to death and ignominy? I could not sustain the horror of my situation, and when I perceived that the popular voice and the countenances of the judges had already condemned my unhappy victim, I rushed out of the court in agony. The tortures of the accused did not equal mine. She was sustained by innocence, but the fangs of remorse tore my bosom and would not forgo their hold. I passed a night of unmingled wretchedness. In the morning, I went to the court. My lips and throat were parched. I dared not ask the fatal question. But I was known, and the officer guessed the cause of my visit. The ballots had been thrown. They were all black, and Justine was condemned. 
I cannot pretend to describe what I then felt. I had before experienced sensations of horror, and I have endeavored to bestow upon them adequate expressions. But words cannot convey an idea of the heart-sickening despair that I then endured. The person to whom I addressed myself added that Justine had already confessed her guilt. That evidence, he observed, was hardly required in so glaring a case, but I am glad of it. And indeed, none of our judges like to condemn a criminal upon circumstantial evidence, be it ever so decisive. When I returned home, Elizabeth eagerly demanded the result. My cousin, replied I, it is decided as you may have expected. All judges had rather that ten innocent should suffer than that one guilty should escape. But she has confessed. This was the dire blow to poor Elizabeth, who had relied with firmness upon Justine's innocence. Alas! said she. How shall I ever again believe in human benevolence? Justine, whom I loved and esteemed as my sister, how could she put on those smiles of innocence only to betray? Her mild eyes seemed incapable of any severity or ill humor, and yet she has committed a murder. Soon after, we heard that the poor victim had expressed a wish wish to see my cousin. My father wished her not to go, but said that he left it to her own judgment and feelings to decide. Yes, said Elizabeth, I will go, although she is guilty and you, Victor, shall accompany me. I cannot go alone. The idea of this visit was torture to me, yet I could not refuse. Well, it wouldn't have been torture if you had only, you know, not run away from the creature you created. We entered the gloomy prison chamber and beheld Justine sitting on some straw at the further end. Her hands were manacled and her head rested on her knees. She rose on seeing us enter. Impressive. That doesn't seem like a position one could easily raise from alone. And when we were left alone with her, she threw herself at the feet of Elizabeth, weeping bitterly. My cousin wept also. Oh, Justine, said she, why did you rob me of my last consolation? I relied on your innocence, and although I was then very wretched, I was not so miserable as I am now. And do you also believe that I am so very, very wicked? Do you also join with my enemies to crush me? Her voice was suffocated with sobs. Rise, my poor girl, said Elizabeth. Why do you kneel if you are innocent? I am not one of your enemies. I believed you guiltless, notwithstanding every evidence, until I heard that you had yourself declared your guilt. That report, you say, is false. And be assured, dear Justine, that nothing can shake my confidence in you for a moment. But your own confession. I. Sorry. I did confess, but I confessed a lie. I confessed that I might obtain absolution, but now that falsehood lies heavier at my heart than all my other sins. The God of heaven forgive me. Ever since I was condemned, my confessor has besieged me. He threatened and menaced until I almost began to think that I was the monster that he said I was. Oh, it looks like interrogation tactics haven't changed. He threatened excommunication and hellfire in my last moments if I continued to abjure it. Dear lady, I had none to support me. All looked on me as a wretch doomed to ignominy and perdition. What could I do? In an evil hour, I subscribed to a lie, and now only am I truly miserable. She paused, weeping, and then continued. I thought with horror, my sweet lady, that you should believe your Justine, whom your blessed aunt had so highly honored, and whom you loved, 
was a creature capable of a crime which none but the devil himself could have perpetuated. Dear William, dearest blessed child, I soon shall see you again in heaven where we shall all be happy. And that consoles me, going as I am to suffer ignominy and death. Um, he was too young for communion, and I thought that the religion of this time would have meant that he could not technically go to heaven by their thought process. I mean, maybe the author of the time knows better, but, um, pretty sure that's not how Christianity worked back then. Because, yes, an infallible religion has changed many times over the years. Pardon me if you are, are Christian. It, I hold no ill will against it, but the history of the church itself is um, interesting. Oh, Justine, forgive me for having one moment distrusted you. Why did you confess? But do not mourn, my dear girl. I will everywhere proclaim your innocence and force belief. Yet you must die. You, my playfellow, my companion, my more than sister. I never can survive so horrible a misfortune. More than sister? I'm assuming that had a different meaning in the 1800s. Dear sweet Elizabeth, do not weep. You ought to raise me with thoughts of a better life and elevate me from the petty cares of this world of injustice and strife. Do not you, excellent friend, drive me to despair. Who's talking? I will try to comfort you, but this, I fear, is an evil too deep and poignant to admit of consolation, for there is no hope. Yet heaven bless thee, my dearest Justine, with resignation and a confidence elevated beyond this world. Oh, how I hate its shrew and mockeries. When one creature is murdered, another is immediately deprived of life in a slow, torturing manner. Then the executioners, their hands yet reeking with the blood of innocence, believe that they have done a great deed. They call this retribution hateful name. When that word is pronounced, I know greater and more horrid punishments are going to be inflicted than the gloomiest tyrant has ever invented to satiate his utmost revenge. Yet this is not a consolation for you, my Justine, unless indeed that you may glory in escaping from so miserable a den. Alas, I would I were in peace with my aunt and my lovely William. Escaped from a world which is hateful to me and the visages of men which I abhor. Justine smiled languidly. This, my dear lady, is despair and not resignation. I must not learn the lesson that you would teach me. Talk of something else, something that will bring peace and not increase of misery. During this conversation, I had retired to a corner of the prison room, where I could conceal the horrid anguish that possessed me. Despair? Who dared talk of that? The poor victim who on the morrow was to pass the dreary boundary between life and death felt not as I did. Such deep and bitter agony. I gnashed my teeth and ground them together, uttering a groan that came from my inmost soul. Justine startled. When she saw who it was, she approached me and said, Dear sir, you are very kind to visit me. You, I hope, do not believe that I am guilty. I could not answer. No, Justine, said Elizabeth. He is more convinced of your innocence than I was, for even when he heard that you had confessed, he did not credit it. I truly thank him. In these last moments, I feel the sincerest gratitude toward those who think of me with kindness. How sweet is the affection of others to such a wretch as I am. It removes more than half my misfortune, and I feel as if I could die in peace, now that my innocence is acknowledged by you, dear lady, and your cousin. 
Yeah, the reason he believes your innocence is because he created the creature that killed his family. But he would sound like a madman. And he thinks that him having to live with this knowledge is ten times worse than you having to uh, lose your life. Because you at least get to go in peace. He has to live with this on his soul. Because he is not decided to go after this guy. He just wants to continue avoiding the wretch. <sighs> Guys are idiots. Thus the poor sufferer tried to comfort others and herself. She indeed gained the resignation she desired. But I, the true murderer, felt the never-dying worm alive in my bosom, which allowed of no hope or consolation. Elizabeth also wept and was unhappy, but hers also was the misery of innocence, which, like a cloud that passes over the fair moon, for a while hides but cannot tarnish its brightness. Anguish and despair had penetrated into the core of my heart. I bore a hell within me which nothing could extinguish. We stayed several hours with Justine, and it was with great difficulty that Elizabeth could tear herself away. I wish, cried she, that I were to die with you. I cannot live in this world of misery. Justine assumed an air of cheerfulness, while she with difficulty repressed the bitter tears. She embraced Elizabeth and said, in a voice of half-suppressed emotion, Farewell, sweet lady, dearest Elizabeth, my beloved and only friend. May heaven in its bounty bless and preserve you. May this be the last misfortune that you will ever suffer. Live and be happy and make others so. As we returned, Elizabeth said, You know not, my dear Victor, how much I am relieved now that I trust in the innocence of this unfortunate girl. I never could again have known peace if I had been deceived in my reliance on her. For the moment that I did believe her guilty, I felt an anguish that I could not have long sustained. Now my heart is lighthearted. The innocent suffers. But she whom I thought amiable and good was not betrayed the trust I reposed in her, and I am consoled. Completely forgetting that if she's innocent, that means there is a murderer of a young boy on the loose. Let's conveniently forget that fact. Except the one who holds guilt, you know. Amiable cousin. Such were your thoughts, mild and gentle as your own dear eyes and voice. But I, I was the wretch, and none ever conceived of the misery that I then endured. Chapter 8 Nothing is more painful to the human mind than after the feelings have been worked up by a quick succession of events. The dead calmness of inaction and certainty which follows and deprives the soul both of hope and fear. Justine died. She rested, and I was alive. The blood flowed freely in my veins, but a weight of despair and remorse pressed on my heart, which nothing could remove. Sleep fe fled from my eyes. I wandered like an evil spirit, for I had committed deeds of mischief beyond description, horrible and more, much, much more. I persuaded myself was yet behind. Yet my heart overflowed with kindness and the love of virtue. I had begun life with benevolent intentions and thirsted for the moment when I should put them in practice and make myself useful to my fellow beings. Now all was blasted, instead of that serenity of conscience which allowed me to look back upon the past with self-satisfaction and from thence to gather promise of new hopes, I was seized by remorse and the sense of guilt which hurried me away to a hell of intense tortures such as no language can describe. This state of mind preyed upon my health, which had entirely recovered from the first shock it had sustained. I shunned the face of man, 
All sound of joy or complacency was torture to me. Solitude was my only consolation. Deep, dark, death-like solitude. My father observed with pain the alteration perceptible in my disposition and habits, and endeavored the reason with me on the folly of giving way to immoderate grief. Do you think, Victor, said he, that I do not suffer also? No one could love a child more than I loved your brother. Tears came into his eyes as he spoke. But it is not a duty to the survivors that we should refrain from augmenting their unhappiness by an appearance of immoderate grief. It is also a duty owed to yourself, for excessive sorrow prevents improvement or enjoyment, or even the discharge of daily usefulness, without which no man is fit for society. This advice, although good, was totally inapplicable in my case. I should have been the first to hide my grief and console my friends if remorse had not mingled its bitterness with my other sensations. Now I could only answer my father with a look of despair and endeavor to hide myself from his view. About this time, we retired to our house in Belrive. This change was particularly agreeable to me. The shutting of the gates regularly at 10 o'clock and the impossibility of remaining on the lake after that hour had rendered our residence within the walls of Geneva very irksome to me. I was now free. Often, after the rest of the family had retired for the night, I took the boat and passed many hours upon the water. Sometimes, with my sails set, I was carried by the wind, and sometimes, after rowing to the middle of the lake, I left the boat to pursue its own course and gave way to my own miserable reflections. I was often tempted, when all was at peace around me, and I the only unquiet thing that wandered restless in a scene so beautiful and heavenly, if I except some bat or the frogs whose harsh and interrupted croaking was heard only when I approached the shore, often I say I was tempted to plunge into the silent lake, that the waters might close over me and my calamities forever. But I was restrained when I thought of the heroic and suffering Elizabeth, whom I tenderly loved, and whose existence was bound up in mine. I thought also of my father and surviving brother. Should I, by my base desert desertion, leave them exposed and unprotected to the malice of the fiend whom I had let loose among them? At these moments I wept bitterly and wished that peace would revisit my mind only that I might afford them consolation and happiness. But that could not be. Remorse extinguished every hope. I had been the author of unalterable evils, and I lived in daily fear lest the monster whom I had created should perpetrate some new wickedness. I had an obscure feeling that all was not over and that he would still commit some signal crime, which by its enormity should almost efface the recollection of the past. There was always scope for fear, so long as anything I loved remained behind. My abhorrence of this fiend cannot be conceived. When I thought of him, I gnashed my teeth, my eyes became inflamed, and I ardently wished to extinguish that life which I had so thoughtlessly, thoughtlessly bestowed. When I reflected on his crimes and malice, my hatred and revenge burst all bounds of moderation. I would have made a pilgrimage to the highest peak of the Andes could I, when there, have precipitated him to their base. I wished to see him again that I might wreak the utmost extent of anger on his head and avenge the deaths of William and Justine. Our house was the house of mourning. My father's health was deeply shaken by the horror of the recent events. Elizabeth was sad and desponding. She no longer took delight in her ordinary occupations. All pleasure seemed to her sacrilege toward the dead. Eternal woe and tears. She, when thought 
was the just tribute she should pay to the innocents so blasted and destroyed. She was no longer that happy creature who in earlier youth wandered with me on the banks of the lake and talked with ecstasy of our future prospects. She had become grave and often conversed of the inconsistency of fortune and the instability of human life. When I reflect, my dear cousin, said she, on the miserable death of Justine Moritz, I no longer see the world and its works as they before appeared to me. Before I looked upon the accounts of vice and injustice that I read in books and were heard of from others as tales of ancient days or imaginary evils, at least they were remote and more familiar to reason than to the imagination. But now misery has come home, and men appear to me as monsters thirsting for each other's blood. Yet I am certainly unjust. Everybody believed that poor girl to be guilty, and if she could have committed the crime for which she suffered, assuredly she would have been the most depraved of human creatures, for the sake of a few jewels to have murdered the son of her benefactor and friend, a child whom she had nursed from its birth and appeared to love as if it had been her own. I could not consent to the death of any human being, but certainly I should have thought such a creature unfit to remain in the society of men. Yet she was innocent. I know. I feel she was innocent. You are of the same opinion, and that confirms me. Alas, Victor, when falsehood can look so alike the truth, who can assure themselves of certain happiness? I feel if I were walking on the edge of a precipice towards which thousands are crowding and endeavoring to plunge me into the abyss, William and Justine were assassinated and the murderer escapes. Oh, now she remembers him. He walks about the world free and perhaps respected. But even if I were condemned to suffer on the scaffold for the same crimes, I would not change places with a, such a wretch. I listened to this discourse with uh, the extremest agony. I, not in deed, but in effect, was the true murderer. Elizabeth read my anguish in my countenance and kindly, taking my hand, said, My dearest cousin, you must calm yourself. These events have affected me, God knows how deeply, but I am not so wretched as you are. There is an expression of despair and sometimes of revenge in your countenance that makes me tremble. Be calm, my dear Victor. I would sacrifice my life to your peace. Dun, dun, dun. We surely shall be happy, quiet in our native country, and not mingling in the world. What can disturb our tranquility? She shed tears as she said this, distrusting the very solace that she gave. But at the same time she smiled, that she might chase away the fiend that lurked in my heart. My father, who saw in the unhappiness that was painted in my face only an exaggeration of that sorrow which I might naturally feel, thought that an amusement suited to my taste would be the best means of restoring me to my wanted serenity. It was from that this cause that he had removed to the country, and, induced by the same motive, he now proposed that we should all make an excursion to the Valley of Chamon. I had been there before, but Elizabeth and Ernest never had, and both had often expressed an earnest desire to see the scenery of this place, which had been described to them so wonderful and sublime. Accordingly, we departed from Geneva on this tour, about the middle of the month of August, nearly two months after the death of Justine. August is a terrible time to travel. I don't know what uh, Switzerland-ish area is like during the middle of August, but I know even here in Maine it sucks. Especially considering air conditioning hadn't been invented yet. I know that's not the point. They're grieving. But ugh, travel in the summer. The weather was uncommonly fine, 
Well, well, there's my answer. And if mine had been a sorrow to be chased away by any fleeting circumstance, this excursion would certainly have had the effect intended by my father. As it was, I was somewhat interested in the scene. It sometimes lulled, although it could not extinguish my grief. During the first day, we traveled in a carriage. In the morning, we had seen the mountains at a distance towards which we gradually advanced. We perceived that the valley through which we wound and which was formed by the river Arve, whose course we followed, closed in upon us by degrees. And when the sun had set, we beheld immense mountains and precipices overhanging us on every side, and heard the sound of the river raging among the rocks and dashing of waterfalls around. The next day, we pursued our journey upon mules, and as we ascended still higher, the valley assumed a more magnificent and astonishing character. I would hate to be a lady having to ride a mule during that time frame. Sorry, Elizabeth. Ruined castles hanging on the precipices of piney mountains, the impetuous arv and cottages every here and there peeping forth from among the trees, formed a scene of singular beauty. But it was augmented and rendered sublime by the mighty Alps whose white and shining pyramids and domes towered above all, as belonging to another earth, the habitations of another race of beings. Well, yes, why do you think tales of giants are so common in uh, that portion of the world? But also, with the exception of the Alps, sounds like a Thomas Kincaid picture. I don't know how to pronounce any of these towns. We passed the bridge of Pelissier, where the ravine which the river forms opened up before us, and we began to ascend the mountain that overhangs it. Soon after, we entered the valley of Chamon. This valley is more wonderful and sublime, but not so beautiful and picturesque as that of Servo, through which we had just passed. The high and snowy mountains were its immediate boundaries, but we saw no more ruined castles and fertile fields. Immense glaciers approached the road. We heard the rumbling thunder of the falling avalanche and marked the smoke of its passage. Mont Blanc, the supreme and magnificent Mont Blanc, raised itself from the surrounding Aguiles, and its tremendous dome overlooked the valley. During this journey, I sometimes joined Elizabeth and exerted myself to the point and exerted myself to point out to her the various beauties of the scene. I often suffered my mule to lag behind and indulged in the misery of my reflection. At other times, I spurred on the animal before my companions that I might forget them, the world, and, more than all, myself. Yeah, sorry, Victor. Wherever you are, there you are. When at a distance, I alighted and threw myself on the grass, weighed down by horror and despair. At eight in the evening, I arrived at Chamon. My father and Elizabeth were very much fatigued. Ernest, who had accompanied us, was delighted and in high spirits. The only circumstance that detracted from his pleasure was the south wind and the rain it seemed to promise for the next day. I love how Ernest keeps being a footnote in this. We retired early to our apartments, but not to sleep. At least I did not. I remained many hours at the window, watching the pallid lightning that played above Mont Blanc and listening to the rushing of the Arve, which ran below my window. And that'll conclude us for the night. I do two chapters, which gives us between 45 and minutes and an hour. And again, I'm very happy that this will be approximately 13 episodes. All right. Thank you all for listening. If you would like, please press the subscribe, leave a review wherever you're uh, listening to it. Uh, we're available several places now. 
Uh, And if you want to interact with me or others who listen, there is a Facebook page. I know, I know, but it's an easy place to communicate, unfortunately. Uh, And it is called the Tangents on Cracked Spines Book Club. And if you have any suggestions for the next book or for how I'm uh, recording, please, by all means, let me know. And if you want to discuss about how the book is going, feel free. Thank you and have a great day, y'all.